Today, Counselor Wong Tam details her experience growing up in Regent Park as a low-income immigrant, her involvement in the social development plan in Regent Park, and the motion she and Counselor Josh Matlow put forward to defund the police. Uh, thank you very much, Fabio, for the introduction and also the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm very excited to be here with you uh, and, uh, and your viewers. Um, my name, of course, is Kristen Wong Tam. Thank you. Uh, I am a Toronto City Councillor. I represent Ward 13, Toronto Centre. It happens to comprise of all of the downtown east in the city of Toronto. Uh, we have some of the most iconic and dynamic neighborhoods uh, in the city from uh, Moss Park, St. Jamestown to Church and Wellesley over to Regent Park uh, and uh, through Cabbage Town, St. Lawrence uh, and beyond. So it's a really dynamic and very exciting, constantly evolving part of the city. Um, I was elected in 2012 and um, it was for me uh, early days as a, as a new political uh, elected official. And I will say that uh, the old ward that I used to represent was even bigger. Um, so after 2018, where Premier Ford redrew the ward boundaries, uh, the, the ward actually became smaller, geographically it was smaller, but interestingly enough, the population density maintained itself. So we are a ward that gets very large during weekdays because we're a major employment center. It also contains uh, the financial district, um, but we're also a ward that actually has a wide range of socioeconomic needs. So some of the poorest, uh, most at need um, and at risk neighborhoods are in Ward 13. Uh, so I spend a lot of my time uh, working with local community agencies and local community members to build neighborhood resilience, uh, being able to um, ensure that the communities I represent have all the resources that they need to build stronger, safer, more inclusive neighborhoods is important to me. Um, and I take that um, very personally because um, I was an immigrant uh, and came to Canada with my parents. Um, English it is, it was not my first language and is not my first language. So I had to sort of readapt uh, just like my parents had to as a, as a newcomer. Um, and of course, decades later, I can honestly say that is no longer my journey. I feel very much embedded in Canadian Toronto society. Uh, but those early days of extreme hardship, extreme poverty have never left me. Um, I still to this day am very, very grateful that I have a roof over my head, I'm housed, I have my health and I have adequate access to food, uh, which was not always the case, especially as a young person with struggling parents. Um, and why I say it's important is because it actually, um, it, it actually influences everything I do and it's actually deeply embedded in my core values. I want to do everything I can to alleviate the suffering of others, to help others, and to make sure that everybody has access and opportunities so that they can be the very best they can be. Um, and that's the kind of approach I bring to, to my work as an elected official now. I wanted to focus on the social development plan in Regent Park and your involvement. Did you first become involved with the SDP as a community member? Um, yeah, so I did live in Regent Park. Uh, my family and I came to Canada in the 70s, mm -hmm. and Regent right. Park was our very first neighborhood. So um, I grew up in social housing. I came from social housing in Hong Kong uh, and, uh, and then moved into social housing in Regent Park. Um, but the difference is that the Hong Kong um, units are very small. It's a tropical island of uh, a population of over 7 million. And the housing costs, not unlike Toronto, but even more so, is extremely expensive. And there were right. intergenerational families. So that means mothers with grandparents and children all growing up together in one household. So the, the social fabric of Regent was very familiar to me. I could see that there were, you know, aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas living <laughs> with the parents and then helping raise the children. So instantly I, I felt that familiarity. I understood those relationships. Um, but Regent uh, was uh, home for a couple of years and I actually attended Spruce Court Public School just up the street in Cabbage Town. Um, but we did not stay in Regent for, for very long. And then from there we moved to other parts of the city. Um, but because right. it was my very first neighborhood, it became very much um, the, the first sort of visual sense of Toronto. I thought Toronto looked like every, I, I thought Toronto looked like Regent, to be quite honest, uh, right. just because I was, I was so young. So I thought that was the city. Um, but of course, it's one pocket of the city. Um, my connection to the social development plan uh, as an elected official uh, largely came to being in 2018. So even though the social development plan for Regent Park uh, was originally developed with the community, local community, uh, back in 2007, and it was adopted by city council, uh, but it was never funded. 
So largely it was a framework that was developed to guide right. the, the management of change in the area and all that was happening. Um, but it didn't have any funding. It, there weren't any tangible attached goals to it. Uh, so when I became the new counselor uh, in 2018, after the war boundaries were redrawn, one of the thir- first things I, I said to my staff person is, what does Regent Park need? What is the leftover work that needs a, a new political champion? And how do we ensure that people who live in Regent or in any other neighborhood have access to City Hall? Um, and that's when the, uh, the staff cited that there was this document called the Social Development Plan, uh, approved by City Council in 2007, but largely sitting on the shelf. Right. So we, we, went work, we went to work right away, and we dusted the report off the shelf and said, so why is it not funded? Um, obviously, it's, it's 11 years later, um, and we need to now refresh it. It's time to think everything that the community had identified in 2007 are those the same needs and priorities in 2018? And, uh, and of course, uh, the community has said no, because there were so many different recommendations. It was almost reading like a wish list, and we needed to prioritize how do we invest strategically to get the outcomes. Um, and so the community are large, largely went to work. Um, in 2019, uh, we put together uh, what was an action plan, and the plan of action was to get it funded. And we had to then also refresh it. So. I'm very happy to say that we worked with the local community, and for the very first time in the history of the social development plan, we got it into the 2020 city budget. Over uh, $635,000 was allocated uh, to make sure that that plan could be implemented. So the revitalization, which is the new buildings, the new amenities, the play field, the community centers, the swimming pools, all those shiny objects that are built in region, those are fantastic. But revitalization is not going to be successful if the people do not feel included or they or further worse than that, they feel left behind. And and that's where the SDP comes in. The social development plan is to invest in those communities. Um, And right now, the uh, the four working groups of Regent Park have really gone to work. Um, They are working around the themes to build out funding priorities so they know how to spend the six hundred thirty five thousand. And the working groups are uh, safety, employment economic opportunities, community building, and communication, uh, communications. So that group is going to tell us when they conclude their work, how would they like to invest the money? And that's what we're going to be doing together. And I think that for, for some people, the revitalization is happening too quickly, right? And then there are others who are, you know, wanting it to just be finished so they can stop living under the, the constant, you know, hum uh, and drilling of construction. Um, right. So I, I think there's probably a little bit of truth in, in, in everything. Um, but the important sure. thing is that the, the SDP is now funded, the community is galvanized, and, uh, and as you have noted, um, you know, there's a lot of new investments into buildings. Um, what's happening with the people? And that's right. why the SDP is critical. I find it fascinating how you look for different avenues to fund the revitalization of Toronto. Can you briefly talk about your failed campaign for Toronto Expo 2025 and how that would have played into your theses as a publicly elected official? Expo 2025 was, uh, was, was an incredible initiative. And uh, clearly, uh, the city of Toronto did not pursue it. So the city did not, uh, number one, uh, agree to make a bid. Uh, they did not uh, necessarily say that they wanted to greenlight the project. Um, but it really is Canada's expo, but located in Toronto. So for, for those who are watching who don't know what an expo is, um, the expo is the same thing as a World's Fair. It is a multi-nation, uh, multi-month coming together where you showcase the very best of the country's innovation, the people talent, and you showcase your culture. And um, the expos that Toronto, so the expos that Canada has hosted largely remain the most popular expos in modern history. Whether it's the expo in Montreal that was hosted in, uh, in 67, uh, or if it was um, uh, Expo 86 in Vancouver, they remain some of the largest people-powered events in the world. Um, 50 million people descended upon the city of Montreal and the region in that city to visit. And they came from all over the world. And Montreal became the leading city in Canada because of their expo. The, the power of expo is, is really not just about competition because there is definitely a little bit of showing off. You want to peacock to the world what your country can do. And I felt that Toronto should, should actually have an opportunity to be that very proud peacock. I wanted to showcase the very best of Canadian innovation, the very best of Canadian talent. And I also wanted to invite the world to Toronto and Canada to, to experience it. We would have to build housing. 
we would have to build transportation because you can't move tens of millions of people around through a six month period because that's how, how long these expos are without investing deeply into the neighborhoods that are hosting these expos. And you have to hire thousands of people to build and to design the expo, expo uh, pavilion and the campus, but also you need to build out uh, lots of people to uh, to ensure that you are able to run the transportation system. You're able to uh, feed them and close them while they are here. So it is a, a economic juggernaut that sort of rolls through the city and it's years of preparation time and then six months where the lights of the world, spotlight of the world are shone upon you. Mm -hmm. And the investment would return itself many times over, right. such as the legacy of affordable housing, the legacy of jobs, the legacy of transportation. And I was hoping that we can drive those investments intentionally into the, into the city's most at risk, most needed neighborhoods so that that prosperity can flow there. Uh, for those who are doing well in Toronto, they will continue to do well. But I was very interested and deeply interested in helping the people who have been left behind. And, and expos are a way for three orders of government Canada, the Ontario government, and the city to focus their energies and to prioritize the execution. Um, oftentimes without a very large catalyst, we know that governments sometimes take the time. Sometimes they don't make a decision and, and nothing gets done. Right. Expos have hard deadlines. You have to get it done because the world is, is being invited to your shores and you cannot say, sorry, we're, we can't open up the fair uh, because we're not ready. You have to meet that deadline. Shifting gears, I want to focus on the motion you and Josh Matlow put forward regarding the defunding of police by 10%. Many activists and members of Black Lives Matter Toronto have felt that the 10% figure was somewhat perplexing and even a compromise. Also, they feel that the $50 million on body camera funding was a failure and not a win. What do you say to these kinds of comments? The, the way I set up that website um, under kristenwongtan.ca, uh, Process for Progress, uh, what we did was we identified the motions that passed and then the motions that failed. So I am not saying that the $50 million to be spent over 10 years for uh, body-worn cameras is a success. I'm simply saying that's the motion that passed. I actually voted against it, largely because instead of reducing the police budget, um, council led by the mayor increased the police budget and I know that the research around body-worn cameras has not drawn out any conclusions that can conclusively say people are more safe uh, because police officers are now wearing body-worn cameras. What we know is that to dismantle structural racism in policing and to ensure that uh, people of color, black and indigenous are not overly policed or subject to uh, harsh police and violent policing, uh, the the introduction of body-worn cameras is not going to eliminate that. To eradicate and deal with structural racism in policing, in the judicial system, in the criminal system, it requires us to dramatically rethink and redesign the system from, from the ground. Um, so I do think that there is fair criticism that can be, um, that can be leveled by you know, uh, folks like Black Lives Matter. And uh, Sandy Hudson and I did have a conversation. She's one of the co-founders of the group about where they were and what they wanted to see, which is, of course, a minimum of 50% uh, of, uh, of the police defunding. Um, however, uh, I think we already know that even eliminating a minimum of 10% of the police budget and redirecting the funds from an over bloated police budget to an underfunded uh, group of uh, community assets and resources was already uh, something that council was not prepared for. So we couldn't even get 10% as a, as a defund movement uh, onto the table, let alone Black Lives Matter request for 50%. The good thing is, and I'm really quite encouraged by this, is that we're on our way to a much bigger conversation at city council than we've ever had before about what we really need to keep the public safe. And good police officers are working very hard day in and day out to try to keep communities safe. The hard part is that they're almost set up for failure. And the reason being is because we're asking them to do far too much. Police are now the first responders to people who are living with mental illness. Uh, if you are someone who is trying to call for help for someone who's homeless, you end up picking up the phone and calling the police. The police arrive with very limited tools uh, in their toolkit. They can write you a ticket or they can arrest you. Those are the policing tools. And uh, writing someone who is, who is having an episode of mental breakdown or mental uh, uh, unwell, they're not unwell, uh, is not gonna help them. 
uh, neither is writing a ticket or arresting someone who is homeless, that doesn't give them a pathway to permanent housing. So that's why I say that the police who are doing um, you know, the very best that they can um, is, is being asked to do the impossible. So we have collectively set them up for failure. They have um, unfortunately now bought into the system where they are now resistant to change. Right. The problem with, with the resistance to change and based on what I've seen from the leadership of the trial police service and notably in Chief Saunders is that they will want to tell you that they're interested in reform but when it comes down to actually doing the work, they are very, um, very unwilling to invest that time and energy. Right. And I, I just wanted to touch on um, anything that could imply that there's some sort of systemic culpability or uh, anything related to minimizing police, violent police intervention or de-weaponizing or anything to do with, um, you know, co community, like sharing that power with the communities mm -hmm. that are being most heavily targeted. I felt like those were, that was the biggest failure, just this kind of admittance of, of a systemic problem and the need to kind of share that power. So yeah. I would wholeheartedly agree with what you just said, Fabio, and all of those were my motions. Right. To, to actually remove the lethal use of force, to eliminate the military style weapons used against civilians, to look for alternatives to 911 calls, uh, to policing, uh, you know, to, to move towards greater accountability, um, all of that, all of that, all of those were my motions. So yeah. I was trying really hard to get to the structural change. Um, and oftentimes, um, you're not, you're not going to necessarily get to that change in one, in one shot. There's, it's not a one moment in time uh, opportunity. Um, that, and that's why I do take some uh, optimism in this conversation is that the citizens of Toronto and the people of Toronto have spoken they have spoken really loudly. They want sustainable policing change and they want it as soon as possible. I have never received so many emails and, and phone calls about any other matter in my 10 years of city, at City Hall than I have uh, around policing. Uh, people right. were just highly motivated to see policing reform. Some people said we didn't go far enough and you can tell that was the, the motion that we, we put together. But then there are others on council who, who felt that we had gone too far. And that was my way of the mayor and his allies. So we're going to have to fight this battle again. Um, as long as the citizens and the residents of Toronto stay energized and committed to fighting with us, uh, I will be there to help, you know, be a political champion for the cause. The hard part has always been, and has always been this, is that there's just not enough of us inside the council chambers. So although there are many residents who are demanding, shouting, begging, and grieving for change, inside the council chambers, power brokers who control council that can actually make the difference are not willing to do it. I would also say that the mayor um, who controls council happens to also sit on the police service board and he controls the police service board, right. which means that if we as a city are truly going to get the policing reforms that we need and desperately need in order to save lives, in order to deliver better and, and stronger um, public safety, then we're going to need the mayor's support. And right now he is not on side. And we need him on side. Thank you so much for joining me. And it was such a pleasure to talk to you and to meet you virtually. But um, <laughs> yeah, and hopefully we can, uh, you know, hopefully in the future, I can get you at another point and, uh, you know, continue the conversation. So thank you so much for your time and uh, looking forward to seeing what you do next. And all right. Yeah. Thank you so thank much you. for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Do you it's have any pleasure. closing comments? or? I, I was just going to say it's a pleasure to chat with you. Um, very nice to connect and meet you here. And I look forward to seeing you and the viewers on the other side. Perfect. All right. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Like, share, subscribe to the channel. Follow us on all our social media platforms. Don't forget to check out our website. And please comment below. Thank you.